kind of resonance should be somewhat stable. Now, let me show you one picture to conclude upon the analytics that shows you within the harmonic approximation how these modes behave. This is the electric field over many decades, and this is the energy of the mode, the frequency of the mode, and what you see up here is, for different magnetic fields, the behavior of these modes. And you see here cyclotron modes that are rather independent on the electric field. You see a center of mass modes which are only at one part dependent, at this edge here, dependent. <coughs> and you see polar modes which are very strongly dependent on, these, uh, on the electric field. So this is roughly the typical behavior which occurs in these resonances. Now, of course, um, if you want to make real statements about uh, the stability of these configurations, you have to do more than just a harmonic analysis. And uh, what we have been doing was uh, using a very powerful tool, namely the multi-configuration time-dependent car tree, which was developed originally for wave packet dynamics of nuclear vibrations in molecules back in the 90s, and is nowadays I think the most powerful tool to up initial calculations for many particle uh, Schrödinger equations uh, for distinguishable particles, but also in the ultra cold regime for bosons or for fermions, if you refer to X segments. So uh, we have been using that tool mm -hmm. to uh, uh, investigate the stability of the giant dipole states and their spectral pro uh, properties. I don't want to go into the details. You can prepare the system according to some. Uh, uh, desired uh, uh, initial state, which is uh, close to this uh, harmonic analysis state, and, 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 and then you can propagate. I don't want to go through that. This is the picture how things look like, for example, for four particles, four electrons that are decent. Well, that you might have guessed, yeah? They are again on the circle, and they, are, they form this uh, equilateral <laughs> behavior here, they have, uh, it's always the same distances between the particles, they have the zero mode again, they have cyclotron modes transversal to the field, they have Coulomb modes along the field, and, and, uh, and they are, of course, a multi-dimensional vibrational problem. But the, uh, compared to the case of two particles, there's no, also, for more than two particles, a certain degree of instability. Yeah. So there are also unstable modes for higher particle numbers. Yeah. And there's this kind of list of modes which occur in these systems. And I, I would go a bit to that. So this concludes, I want to have a few minutes for the n ion still. Uh, so this concludes this part for the giant dipole states. Um, I have been showing you the existence of these giant dipole atoms. For me, naturally, when we did that, the question arised: is it possible to form matter principally in all in that giant dipole states. Everything we know from normal matter can be transferred. Can we go to molecules? Yeah? That question can be answered positively in um, There's actually three types of molecules. How we can do that? Uh, there's also molecular resonances. And this is the question I, I was just posing. Uh, can we make out of these giant dipole atoms by putting them together something like giant dipole matter? Dilute matter, of course, because you don't want to bring them closely together, otherwise this is all kind of uh, ending up in an explosion. So, uh, but these are open questions, and uh, uh, so far, so good. <coughs> I think I have how much time left? <coughs> Eight minutes. Eight, Eight minutes? Right. But wait a minute, we started ten minutes after ten minutes. Oh, sorry, you're right. Yes. Thank you. 18. Yeah. 18. Excuse yeah. me. Right. That looks much better. <laughs> okay, so um, let me come to the second part. This is exotic whisper species part two. <coughs> Now this goes to a different situation. What I had so far were neutral atoms <coughs> have been imposing strong fields, combination of magnetic and electric fields, and have been tearing apart one electron and making these decentered, what people call decentered states, giant dipole states. Now I come to another species which is extremely important uh, for molecular erections, 
or atmospheric sciences or whatever, and it is negative ions. It is, you put an extra electron on a sphere, on an atom, for example, and you form, like from hydrogen, H minus, for example. Uh, now I will tell you a little bit a uh, uh, motivation about why doing that, and then let's see how far I will get uh, in trying to describe to you uh, what happens if we impose magnetic fields on these systems. Um, as I try to indicate, ionides play a really important role for many different types of physical environments, for atmospheres, for plasmas, but particularly also in our sun, most of the opacity comes from the fact that you have the transitions from uh, bound to uh, continuum of the H minus ion. And in interstellar space, this is a key channel through which you form molecules H going through H minus. Okay, um, let me tell you a little bit about the uh, features of ions. They are very much different from positive ions. Like take H, put an electron there, you get an H minus. But oppos opposite to normal atoms, where you can form Rydberg atoms, infinite series of Rydberg atoms, an extra electron put to H has only one bound state. And even more, that one bound state is bound only due to correlation effects. If you would do a normal Hartree 4 calculation, there would be no bound state. So, this is a subtle object. Uh, its binding is peculiar, and the binding is typically weak. It's not weak like a Rydberg atom, but it's weak compared to the binding in the ground state of normal electrons. So, the extra electrons are <coughs> sort of behaving differently from the core electrons. Then there's a whole series of elements, of atoms, that have no negative ions. You can put the electron there, there is no bound state. Then, generally speaking, for most of the atoms, there is only one bound state, not only for H. For most of them, there is only one bound state. There's a few species that have two bound states. I'm not sure there are any of the three. So, the question is, uh, uh, the, the question is now, how does this whole thing behave if you switch on a magnetic field? Now we're going to show you a few pictures which are the strong magnetic field situation. So forget about laboratory. Switch on something which is not accessible in laboratory. What's happening? Now here you see strong magnetic fields, hundreds or thousands of Teslas. And you see that the singlet energy is coming down and the triplet energy is going up. So that means you have a ground state crossover with increasing magnetic field, triplet goes down, singlet goes up. Triplet goes down is clear because there's already a Zeeman shift which lowers the energy due to the spin triplet term. Um, now, then also you see that the binding energy is changed severely. Now, this is the singlet state binding energy. This is the triplet state binding energy. So you see there's huge changes in the binding energies with changing magnetic field. There's even here some triplet uh, binding induced by the magnetic field. Okay? So this, let's skip over this. Um, let, let's come to what is laboratory. There was a statement back very early work by Everett Hirsch and Simon mathematical physicist, and they have used functional analytical tools to make statements about the spectra of these systems. They have been working a lot on Schrodinger theories in magnetic fields or generally in electric and magnetic fields. And their statement was the following, and that's also when we started entering into the field. There was the statement that singly negative atomic ions possess in the presence of a magnetic field of air strengths infinitely many bound states. Now that's a strong statement. I just told you there's either one bound state or there's none, and a few ones have two. Now this, those guys say that whatever the magnetic field is, you have infinitely many bound states. Now, uh, that motivated us, since this was a math work and hard to read, just getting finally some formula, uh, 
uh, we, we said, okay, let's try to get a hold on the binding mechanisms, and let's try to physically understand what is the background of these mathematical statements, and what are the properties of these field-induced amniotic bound states. Now, how we approach this problem is as follows. Yeah. <coughs> These field-induced states are weakly bound. So the whole prediction of field induced bound states, if you go to laboratory fields, they are weakly bound as Rydberg states are too. If you go to n equal to 30, 40, 100, this is extremely weakly bound. <coughs> Similar here, but here the binding depends on the magnetic field strength. Because it is magnetic field induced, as you shall see. So uh, you have an extra electron, and that extra electron out there should be treated differently from the core of the atom, which is neutral. Now, it's not Rydberg, where I have a minus electron and plus core. Now, we have a minus electron and a neutral core. That's a much weaker interaction. Uh, but again, you can separate between a slowly moving outer electron and a core where everything is moving fast, where the electrons are moving fast. That's why you can make a quasi molecular approach to this binding. Okay, let's do that. So we have a total Hamiltonian for the anion, which represents a Hamiltonian from the core, a Hamiltonian of the outer electron, and an interaction Hamiltonian, which is the interaction between the outer electron and the core. And then you do an elevated separation, like you do in Born Oppenheimer, like uh, Jan Michael Rose nicely explained, you do in Born Oppenheimer separation between the slow outer electron and the fast inner degrees of freedom. And, and, and then you get a potential energy surface, but now the potential energy surface is due to a fixed position of the outer electron, not like in von Oppenheim where we have fixed nuclei, it's a fixed position of the outer electron and then uh, and, and the inner core part, and in that problem, what is rapidly moving is the core electrons. Okay, so um, now, <coughs> how to get a hold on this interaction term. Yeah? Hn appeared over here first. How to get a hold on that one? Now, the interaction of the external electron with the core, this has a charge and this is neutral. If you do a multipole expansion, what you get is first a quadrupole term and then a polarization potential. These two terms are given here. Now, uh, look at this. This term is quadrupole, it is anisotropic, it has z coordinates in that particular. It turns out, so it's 1 over r to the 3 here, it turns out that this is extremely small for typical atoms. The dominant term by far is this term, which is polarization interaction. The charge induces a dipole, and these two interact. This is the <coughs> polarization potential, which goes with 1 over r to the 4. Now, we know if you take the polarization potential and try to find bound states, there is none. Yeah, if you analyze this, there is no bound states of the electron <coughs> far apart in the asymptotics to this neutral core. So this is true in three dimensions, because it's a three-dimensional problem. But this is the point where now the magnetic field comes into play. We have a new Hamiltonian now. The new Hamiltonian has this kinetic energy, the magnetic field part in it, as it was over here, the magnetic field part, kinetic energy, along the magnetic field, there's no coupling to the magnetic field, and this potential energy surface, which comes from this for optimal quasi-molecular approach to, of the slow electron and the inner part. Now, you have put, to put this together. And, and, and this part contains what is given here, yeah, these polarization interactions. <coughs> so let's put all of that together. Now we have to realize the following. This outer electron is very far from the neutral. It feels a polarization interaction, but predominantly perpendicular to the magnetic field, if the magnetic field is in this direction, perpendicular to the magnetic field, the magnetic field interaction is dominating. Now, in lowest order, you can describe this simply as a lambda orbital, which is the solution of a free charged particle in a magnetic field. These lambda orbitals have two quantum numbers. The one is the principal lambda quantum number and the angular momentum quantum number. They have some peculiarities, 
and the general themes, which I do not want to address in detail, I just want to emphasize here that this angular <coughs> momentum we call S from now on. That's the LZ angular momentum. If the electron circulates in the xy plane, this is the angular momentum around the b-axis, and this is what is conserved here. And there is, of course, infinitely many lambda orbitals with changing <coughs> S, with changing angular momentum. Uh, now, <coughs> this gives you a clue on what is happening in the magnetic field. This outer electron can have can uh, occupy these lambda orbitals. Now, if you make an adiabatic approach again, say assuming that your potential along of the motion along the magnetic field axis is given by the projection of the lambda orbitals, which is the NS, the principal lambda quantum number, angular momentum quantum number, the projection of these states or, or, or the, the expectation value of, within these states of that uh, energy EC, which is the polarization potential, essentially, then you get an effective potential along the Z direction. So what I may picture is transversal to uh, the magnetic field. I have lambda orbitals due to the dominance of the magnetic field. Along, I do have the projection uh, of this polarization potential onto these states. Then I get an effective potential along. Now it turns out that this effective potential, which is now in the equation of motion for, <coughs> uh, for the z direction, that this does bind indeed. Okay, so this 1D potentials, which I call here V of N and S, which are these guys here, these indeed do bind. Because in one dimension you have a very strong theory, the weak coupling one dimensional theory, and that tells you if I have a uh, integral of V being less than zero, then definitely there's a bound state. Now I do have infinitely many such lambda orbitals, and each one contributes at least one bound state. So I have infinitely many bound states. Yeah? That's the conclusion. So that's the physics behind this. And now you see uh, how these guys came. This is the energies, yeah? Um, obviously, to know Rydberg atoms where everything is dominated by Coulomb, or maybe by additional fields, now the whole binding is going through the polarizability and the magnetic field. So for S equal to zero, you have this k kappa squared, b squared behavior of the binding energy. And for S on 2, which means for non-zero angular <coughs> momentum, you have this vague to the third and kappa squared. Now, these are all small numbers, yeah? Polarizabilities are, uh, of course, depending on the species. If you take cesium, you will see in a minute much larger than compared to hydrogen. Uh, so you have a large variability here, but they are small because B is small. Yeah, it's a B squared effect. Thank you. It's a B squared effect or B to the third power effect. And then there is uh, relations for these uh, prefactors here. Uh, there's a kind of defining relation for the data. Okay, so now you can do also numerics with this. But before I show the results of the numerics, when you solve the time dependent, the time uh, stationary Schrödinger equation for these problems, let's have a look at numbers. Yeah, so you get a feeling for this. The very weakly bound systems. Yeah, um, take cesium, which has already a significant polarizability of 403 then you get 10 to the minus 5 milli electron volt binding energy in the S equal to 1, and 2 milli electron volt binding energy in the S equal to 0. Now, there is a bottleneck to this here, which is that cesium has already a bound state. It has a zero angular momentum state already. That's the normal, not the magnetic field induced, but the normal cesium minus state. And therefore, the cesium minus state uh, how you might call it, will collapse with this magnetic field induced. So here the magnetic field induced is, uh, is not detectable. It's interacting with the S equal to zero magnetic field induced, but the S equal to one should be detectable. Here the situation is different. The star indicates beryllium has no field-free bound state. There is no beryllium minus. But there is, of course, magnetic field induced. So this one is now detectable. Yeah? 
it's 0.02 milli electron volt, and then you see a big gap to the next one, which is an excitation. Yeah. And then you get this scale, uh, according to the scaling here, where you get weaker and weaker binding energy. <coughs> so, so you can play with this, take your favorite species, and, and, and create the corresponding bounce things. Yeah. Now, um, I should come to an end. Um, uh, this is what I would like to mention uh, before closing. What I did not take into account in this picture for the anions, the magnetic, magnetic field induced anions so far, is that also these systems can move in the magnetic field. That means uh, the system, I took the first system with fixed nucleus and looked into the electronic structure. Now, but these systems are generally allowed to move. Moving, as you know now, creates additional electric fields, and these electric fields can spoil my bound states. And therefore, to make real predictions for experiments, one should, of course, do the calculation, including the motion of the systems, and then some of these infinitely many bound states turn into resonances, and others remain bound states. And here you have, and this is the final graph, you have uh, a picture where you have the polarizability as a horizontal axis, the B field as a vertical axis, and you have these domains of bound states, no bound states, uh, with generic fields and polarizabilities, and then this has to be modified accordingly, depending on how strong you move in the magnetic field. So I hope I could give you a little bit of uh, an outline that there's an interesting types of exotic species in uh, external fields, referring to weakly bound or Rydberg character. Thanks for listening. <laughs>